Hi, how's everybody doing today? This is Rich here on behalf of Rich TV Live with Jeff, who is the CEO of Greenbrier Capital Corp. How are you doing today, Jeff? Hey, I'm doing great, uh, Rich. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us. Now, you've been kind of like the talk of our community. Uh, Peter, who is a member of our community and trading academy, introduced me to your company. And it's funny because he told me about you guys when you were at 50 cents. And he kept saying to me, Rich, look at Greenbrier, Rich. And it was at 60 and then it went 70 and then it went 80, then 90 and then a dollar. And then I started really paying attention. I'm like, what is what what yeah. what is going on here? And then now right. we're at like almost four dollars. Mm -hmm. So right. um, we're mm -hmm. live on YouTube. We have about sixty countries that we have people that watch within our community that are just okay. looking for undervalued, underappreciated, underexposed companies. You guys have been doing incredibly well. A lot of members have made extremely huge returns already and are holding a lot. Some have already taken returns and are like, oh my God, it's going even higher and they want to get back in again. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about the company just to get started and then we can go a little bit into a couple questions after you. Sure. So Greenbrier is kind of a continuation of Western Wind. That was a company I started back in 2002 and I sold the company to Brookfield Asset Management in 2013 for $420 million cash. We had a project, a big, big project that was going in at the time of the sale. We couldn't put it in because in the bidding process, uh, couldn't introduce more assets. This was our actually big, big project that was going to increase the value by double. Uh, Brookfield did not want the uh, the playing field change. They didn't want any more assets to come in. So we held back on the asset. Uh, when the company was bought out, we made an, a deal with them that we were free to take the project, the Montalvo Montal project, and put it into Greenbrier. So I started Greenbrier back in 2009 as a CPC, knowing that my, the comp my company would, have, would be bought out. And in 2011, we converted the CPC into a real estate company because uh, we didn't want to waste money on mining or anything that, you know, where, you, where dollars get spent. So we found a subdivision where a guy spent $21 million getting 688 homes approved, uh, the lots approved. And this was in 2006. And when the super recession came and he lost the project, it was for sale for a million bucks. So 688 lots in the middle of a city of 37,000 people for a um, million dollars. We bought it in 2011. That formed the basis of our our mm -hmm. listing from the CPC to becoming um, uh, for becoming a real estate issuer. So now Greenbrier in 2011 became a real estate company. And then in 2013, when I sold uh, Western Wind, we put the solar project into Greenbrier as well. So we had a big real estate project, a big solar project. We didn't expect to work on the real estate project right away. We knew it was a seven, eight year deal, uh, but Puerto Rico got into some trouble. We played with them for a couple of years, try to work with them. You know, we we're supposed to go to, there was a big article in the uh, National Post front page business edition that we should have been trading at seven, that we will be trading at $17 a share, $18 a share when the project gets approved. Uh, prep a one move on the project, which was completely strange because there was no utility in the United States that ever awarded a contract and then refused to honor the contract. So we played with them for a couple of years, took them to court, we sued, we got a damage, uh, a damage award uh, by the judge. And then Puerto Rico moved into, uh, Puerto Rico moved into, um, uh, into uh, bankruptcy. It's kind of a, Puerto Rico can't go bankrupt, but it moved up, it's called Title III, so it's kind of a consensual receivership. Um, we moved the litigation to federal court. Then I spent all two years in Congress, 2007 to 2008. Um, and then, you know, two hurricanes later, and to be honest with you, through all the work we did, it wasn't for the earthquake in, two th in the beginning of this year that took out a 1,000 megawatt power station, we'd still be kind of moving along. But they've lost a 1,000 megawatts of generation. It was a catastrophic wow. event. Um, they accepted our contract. They S the uh, accelerated the negotiations. We got what we wanted. Um, and we're the biggest project in the island, massive project. Coincidentally, our real estate project because it was bought nine years ago is coming to fruition at the same time. So it's a double whammy, you know, for the price of one. And so, um, you know, for the viewers, let me drill down. So when I got into renewables in the year 2000, 
renewable energy was a disruptive technology. So it was unlike other um, infrastructure assets where, uh, you know, the very boring returns, eight, nine percent, like social investing infrastructure is the same, you know, single digit returns. When you have a disruptive industry like wind and wind and solar, uh, particularly wind at the time, it's a redemptive tool. It's a redemptive technology. It's good for you. It's social investing, but it's only disruptive if something phenomenal happens. So in the case of uh, the year 2002, when I started uh, Western Wind, uh, there was a mandate that utilities were forced to buy a certain percentage of their electricity from renewable generation. And because of that, there were sky high prices. So if you wanted to go to the, the, the pinnacle, California, New York, the New England states, Hawaii, some Midwestern, some Midwestern states, those places had substantially high, really high wholesale prices. So you could make, not only could you make, we were making 80, 90% equity returns a year. And I, I built Western Win on that. And, you know, the, the, the achievement for me, I think for everybody was we only raised 70 million bucks. So we sold it for 420 million. So there's only two companies that did that. It was Western Wind and Goldman Sachs. Everybody else, including, you know, John McDonald, who found McDonald Detweiler, who's he might not even he might not even be alive. If he was, he'd probably be about 85 years old, 90 years old. You know, billionaires from all over the world wanted to create renewable, they created renewable companies, they put in billions of dollars and they all lost money. They got their ass handed to them. Uh, what so what makes I think what makes me us special is we, re, we got in the industry and we returned extremely high returns. So we focused on the money, on getting the right projects and the right prices. So if you turn the clock forward now, there's only two places left that have spectacular returns. That's Puerto Rico and Hawaii. And so the most common question is, well, if I, if I got $50 billion and I just walked to Hawaii, you know, I can muscle my way in. You can't because if you don't have the appropriate land package and more importantly, if you're not tied to a transmission line that has access, Hawaii's got no access. It's a very fragile. Everybody's been to Oahu. You've seen you've seen Honolulu, but once you leave Honolulu, you've got this very fragile low voltage system that goes to the small towns. You can't connect for more than five or ten megawatts. So you got to be got to be in the queue. You got to have your commission your, your transmission tied up, and you're gonna and yes, you'll get a five or ten megawatt deal. It'll be very lucrative, but you're not going to get a hundred megawatt deal. So here we are, Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico has three times more people than Hawaii. It's got the same problem. They use oil to make electricity, which is extremely dirty and expensive. They've got a thirty. They got a thirty cent effective cost base. Uh, Hawaii is about a forty three cent cost base. So when we sell them solar power at twelve cents, they're still paying half the price of what it's costing them. But twelve cents is four to six hundred percent higher than anywhere else in the United States. Plus. Wow. We have do doubled the solar radiation. So for every million dollars we spend in solar panels, we get between 800 to 1200 percent more revenue. Now, wow. naturally, everybody wants in. That's why Prep, you know, bought the contracts after they gave it because you got a bunch of jealous guys. Well, the problem is they needed the project, and they fought, fought, fought. We sued. We went to Congress. We beat them up. We did a lot of things, you know, um, legally, and then finally they couldn't do anything about it. And at the end of the day, uh, when the power station went out. Even the the ten percent of the political class that was holding back ninety percent of the population, they capitulated as well. They were yelling and screaming at the utility. How come you didn't sign these solar contracts that you were supposed to sign three three years ago? So right now in Puerto Rico, we've got the highest and richest contract in the whole United States. On top of that, we've got the best site, the highest solar radiation by double, and the the the, the fluke of nature, the, the big luck is that where this highest solar radiation is happens to be where the strongest transmission system is. So nobody else can connect on our interconnection point, and that makes it an ideal location. All of the rest of the projects, 95% of them are small, tiny, 20-megawatt projects. They're on the north end of the island where the rainforest is, low solar radiation, very scattered distribution lines, low voltage, 12 kV, 22 kV, 38 kV, very unstable, they might only build five or 10 megawatts. 90% of those projects aren't going to get built. Um, and so we have a massive contract and we will end up doubling it from 80, from 160 DC, 80, 80 AC to 320 DC, 160 AC. That, that's in our, that's actually in our, um, in our, uh, it's in our contract to do that. Wow. 
So you're looking at about a $300 million market cap, which fully diluted is about $11.67 a share. So I think one of the questions, uh, one of your readers called me, sent me an email, and he said, look, because I think everybody in uh, Rich TV wants to hear this, um, <laughs> the full value of the project is not reached on commercial production. Infrastructure assets reach their full value when you start construction. Because when, when you start construction, that's when you're fully funded by the banks. The banks do not consider a project to have any risk the day that you start construction. And it's got the full value. Why? Because number one, there's no risk. I mean, there's zero risk. No, no bank puts 200 million or 400 million in a, in a construction account if there's any risk. There's no risk. But once you build the project from that day going forward, it's an appreciating asset. Even though it lasts for 25 years, the value goes down every day. So the maximum value of that project is the day we have what's called financial flows or another term is NTP, notice to proceed. That's when the money in the construction escrow account gets released and then the, the project actually starts meaningful construction. And that's about four or five months from now. It might be wow. six. I don't think it'll be three, but about five or six months. So that's when you get full value. That's when you get the Brookfields, the Ontario Pension Fund, all the big entities that are looking for a 7% coupon. Uh, and, and, if you, and if you value this even at an 8 or 9% coupon, you're looking at about $300 million. So that's what the market's excited about. Uh, 1167 US is around 16 bucks. I think we closed today around four. We're about 25% of the way there. And that's not including our Sage Ranch, which is going to be start. Get, we should have our final entitlement within two to three months. And then we, we can start construction there as well. We own 50% of that with Captiva. Um, uh, there's about $55 million US for each, each uh, profit from each, each party. Uh, but that's about a four-year build. So you're looking at 12, 13 million a year US uh, every year for each company on that project. So we're wow. excited about it, right? The market, the market's not even looking at, looking at that as well. So that kind of gives you an idea of what's going on. This is this was supposed to happen in 2013. That's why the National Post put on the front page of the business section that this was a 17, $17.80 stock. They did it because it was supposed to happen in 2013. And I never gave up because I knew that if I had to go to Supreme, even the Supreme Court, that the judges would not rule against me because my, my biggest ace in the hole was if we were trying to build this pricey contract, let's say in British Columbia, where the energy rates are, you know, maybe six or seven cents a kilowatt. I haven't looked at, I haven't, I haven't looked at my energy bill in Vancouver in a long time now, but let's just say it's nine cents Canadian and you get a 12 cent U S contract, uh, which is like 17 cents Canadian. The judges might rule. They might say something like, you know what? You're legally right, but this is a mother earth issue. We're not going to uh, hurt the population by allowing this 17 cent contract to go through. Maybe, you know, here's some damages, do this, do that. But we, we don't want to hurt the ratepayer. It's not legally right, but sometimes the, the Supreme Court in Canada uh, is a little bit weird that way. I don't know if that'd be the case in the United States, but I was prepared for that argument. Of course, the argument is they're not paying six cents, they're paying 30 cents. So whatever, whatever I was offering, whatever the, the contract that we have is still half price of what they're paying. And it'll be half price of whatever they're paying. So we're providing a service. It's a win-win deal. Should have happened seven years ago. It's happening today. I'm happy about it. The shareholders are seeing what's called a delayed reaction. That's what's going on. Like an elastic band effect. Yeah, it, it should. Yeah, the chart. Absolutely. The chart is beautiful, man. Like, congratulations on that. Like, wow. Like, I've never seen much. I have not really seen well, too many things you know, like it. Talk, <laughs> they always talk about the hockey stick uh, chart, but. This doesn't look like a hockey stick. This kind of more looks like uh, straight up. I don't know what. <laughs> straight up. Yeah, it's just going yeah, straight up like every day. Guy. Yeah, it, it's good. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's kind of like a bouncy castle, right? You, you bounce up, but only one way. <laughs> um, you know, I think I think the way the market's heading is uh, people know the value. There's obviously big interest in Asia. CMAC is a forty billion dollar company. Um, you know, the buyers, you know, you're not getting one guy buying a million shares. You're getting tens of thousands of people buying thousands of shares. They're putting it away. They're very disciplined on the bid side. I don't think you're going to see a classic correction where, you know, it continues up and then it goes down to half the pricing. No, that's not going to happen. I think you're going to see the bidders knowing what they're going to want to pay, what they're going to want to keep. It may not have, I've been in two public companies in my life, both Greenbar and Western Wind. 
where I've had the, the vertical chart and I've never had the correction. Like when Green Bar went to 325, when I sold when I sold Western Wind, I didn't even pick up the telephone and Green Bar went from 80 cents to 325 without me calling anybody. Wow. It stayed there for a year and a half while, while people were thinking, you know, we were going to win the battle in the short term. It never corrected. It only corrected when, you know, we weren't making traction on winning the battle. And, you know, a few, a few guys passed away. Uh, seriously, you know, a few hundred thousand, you know, and the market just kind of drifted down. But uh, there was, there was a day last happened. week, Jeff, sorry, there was a day last week where it dipped to dollar thirty three. And I was like, oh my goodness, is this is this the short? Is this a correction? And then you guys bought it. Like it, it just kind of went right back up. There was one day. You remember that day last week? There was the I one so. dip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what the yeah, hell I mean, happened I, there? I, I, you guys had a dip. I, What's wrong with you guys? <laughs> yeah, I check in I check in trading honestly like three times a day. I have a delayed machine. Um, you know, I've been through this before. Uh so but yeah, it, I think that by that, you know the buyers are disciplined, so um, they're not going to go, Oh, you know, 20,000 people at the same time are going to wake up one morning. They, these people are looking to accumulate. In fact, we're getting five, 600 emails a day wow. uh, in China. People are saying, <laughs> you know, we want to buy more, you know, we want to buy more. So I think you're wow. going to see, I want, you think you're going to see more of a, like when it does plateau and I can't, I can't tell you where it's going to plateau. It's obviously going to go past six bucks Canadian because you need four bucks U.S. And I'm not wow. watching the Canadian dollar every day either. I think it's like 0.74, but you know, you're going to see a point where, okay, I'm not going to go pay more than $6 for the time being. And you're going to see a base, but you know, we're five, six months away from a very spectacular time in our history. And um, you know, things are happening. So, you know, the takeaway from this is in addition to what I just said, we're going to get a lot more contracts in Puerto Rico because they need the power um, and there's nowhere else to build but where we are, only because of the transmission and because of the solar radiation. If there was some big transmission in the north, the problem you would have, the north, the trade winds come to Puerto Rico in the northeast. They come around 16 miles an hour average around Vieques uh, into the little island of Culebra. They hit the northeast of the island, and then they exit out five hours later in the southwest, five hours later. By the time it goes over that ridge, there's a 100-mile ridge, right? So Puerto Rico is 100 miles long, 35 miles wide. When it goes over that rainforest, it drops all of its moisture. By the time it gets to the, the southwest, I mean, you got to see the place, Rich. I mean, if you go to the if you go there on the rainy season, you, it's the only place in Puerto Rico you'll see dry grass. So it wow. is absolutely a spectacular microclimate. It's really exciting. I have a couple questions for you. Do you mind if I ask you a couple questions? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so the first one, um, this is actually from Peter. Uh, when do you anticipate the Montolva ribbon cutting? Well, the governor wants to do one before like the heavy, heavy construction. So we have to do a political ribbon, ribbon cutting. You're probably looking, the, we're actually for that, we're only waiting for the COVID uh, deal. So, the, you know, I got calls up like three days ago for the governor wants to come down now with the cameras, everybody. So, wow. You know, give, yeah. So give us notice. It'll probably be July. Um, it'll be, you know, we'll, we'll have the, we'll have CMAC, uh, we'll have a couple board members. We'll have the governor, definitely the governor of Puerto Rico will be there to open it. Wow. We will probably have the congresswoman for Puerto Rico, Jennifer, uh, as well. She's, they call her the resident commissioner. So she's, you can use the name congresswoman. You can, resident commissioner is a, a classical name. What it is, it's the person in Puerto Rico that sits in us Congress that represents Puerto Rico's needs. But there's only there's only one of her. It's if this if Puerto Rico was a state, you would have like five congressmen. You'd have five representatives and two senators. You'd have seven congressmen, and here you have only one, and that's Je and Jennifer. So Jennifer will be there. Wanda will be there. The governor, uh, the you know, we'll definitely have the university because we're going to obviously train some electrical engineers on solar. We'll have the trades school. We're looking at July. I can't tell you the exact date, but it'll be sometime in July. Very sure. good. So we're not far, guys. Maybe like four to six weeks, maybe. Um, I have another question for you. How much revenue do you anticipate with the Montalva project? Well, again, you're not you're not looking at um, you're not looking at the revenue. You're not looking at commercial production to get your full value. You're getting your full value at the start of construction, but it'll kick out about thirty nine, forty million a year, and about thirteen million of discretionary cash flow. So one of my objectives, obviously, I've been a, I've been an anti-dilutionary guy 
since, since my first, I started my first public company in 1980. I went public with my first public company in 1985. And, um, I was always an anti-delusionary guy. That, that was how I was raised, how That's I think. Great. That's um, great. I, I could have, yeah, I could have taken my 3 million bucks that the company owes me and converted a stock at 40 cents. I never did it. That's why I've got a, that's why I've got 53,000 shareholders is because people know they trust me. 99.9999% of people would have taken that $3 million debt and they would have issued shares to 40 cents three, three months ago. They, they, I would have, they would have done it back in 2016. I never did one conversion. I'll, I'll take my 3 million bucks when the project is in production and, uh, and, and, and I'll be happy with that because I believe in the shareholder. Number one is a shareholder. My father came to Canada in 1949. Um, you know, I believe in, I believe, I believe in a guy owning a thousand shares as much as I believe in a guy owning a million shares. It's all about the little guy. That's the most important thing. Think about the little guy and you'll be successful. I love that. When do you anticipate the Sage housing project construction to start? It should have started already. Um, uh, it should have started already. The, the city's working through the design guidelines. It's a big thing for them, right? They're, you know, they're choking a little bit, a thousand homes, you know, we're going to be the big wheels in town. You know, there's a little bit of little pe petty jealousies and all that. But wow. at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we got them covered because they have a law in California called SB 35. And because there's 2.4 million homes short shortage in California, affordable homes. And this is what we're building entry level homes. Um, if you, you SB 35 says that you have, if you go to a piece of the property that has the zoning, to build whatever you want to build, in our case, the zoning's for a thousand, a thousand units, and the city doesn't give it to you. SB thirty five overrides the local government. Wow. So we're we're being nice guys with the city right now. I mean, I, if they're going to hear this, they'll. I don't give a shit what they think, but bottom line is we'll build two thousand homes, and then we'll really freak them out. But <laughs> the, and anyone with that too, by the way. But we're yeah, we're working on what's called the design guidelines, and the design guidelines are, um, you know, basically when you build based on the elevations and the architectural drawings, you know, uh, what, 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 what the color scheme will look like, stucco, brick, uh, you know, um, you know, roof overhang, things like that. Um, the city would like to control things like, you know, how much you're going to spend on your paint, what, what the stucco density is going to be. That's completely unheard of. There's not a city in the world that has that. So if you want to get really forensic, that's what we're, we're arguing over. We're saying to the city, hey, you got no business to tell us. We've given you design guidelines that are higher than your own design guidelines. We passed the one-year environmental report with flying colors. Now you got to give us the entitlement. Um, you know, you know, we'll talk to you. We have to talk. Obviously, we're going to be partners in this. Um, but they basically are, have to give us the entitlement. When they give us the entitlement, then we start building. And I, I would expect two, three months away. I think you know we're we're we're, night, we're good. We you know we're good corporate citizens. I don't want to go the SB thirty five route. Well, to be honest with you, the shareholders are going to make more money if I go the SB thirty five route because then I'll just build three thousand units and have ten thousand people move in from Los Angeles. So wow. I don't mind going that way and making more money for my shareholders. But we're we're we're, we're good corporate citizens working hard with the city, and we're doing our job. But that was the if you if you go into a map of Tehachapi, it's kind of funny. So it's, it's a valley of 37,000 people. Um, it's 90 miles from LA. It's got the four seasons. So it snows in the winter, a lot of snow. Uh, temperature never goes above 85 degrees in the summer. If you go 10 miles away in the desert, Mojave, it's 110 degrees. You have 400,000 people in Antelope Valley, Palmdale, Lancaster. There's a huge gang problem. But the, but the irony is, the heart of the American aviation industry is in Antelope Valley. It's at Edwards Air Force Base, Mojave. You have SpaceX. You have Edwards. You have got Northrop. You got the B twenty one bomber. It's a it's an eighty billion dollar bomber program that was funded two years, and they can't get engineers to go there. When these guys get off the plane, and these guys are usually reservists as well. They have a master's degree in aerospace engineering. They go they go to the they go to the facility. They go to Edwards and they go, "This is fabulous." And then their wife and kids they go look around. And they go. I don't want to. I don't. I don't want. I don't want to live here. Like it was safer in Iraq and in, 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 in Afghanistan than it was living in Palmdale and Lancaster. So Tehachapi is forty. Instead of driving forty miles to the south and two hours of traffic to go to L.A., you go forty miles to the northwest, and you're in a, a valley of thirty-seven thousand people. It's the safest city in Kern County. 
And then we have 500,000 people in Bakersfield, and it's a 40-mile drive to the east. So there's about a million people feeding that valley of 37,000 people. So if you look at Tehachapi, go on Google, and there's a weird geopolitical subdivision called the city of Tehachapi. So Tehachapi is 37,000 people. Most of it's unincorporated. It's in a place called, it's, it's in Kern County. So you'll see all this density, but go city of Tehachapi on Google, Google Maps, and you'll see the outline and go right in the middle and you'll see this big open piece of land completely surrounded by homes. It's adjacent the high school to the right, to the east. It's got the elementary school to the left adjacent. It's got the middle, the middle school, the middle school one block to the north, and it's got downtown five blocks away. So it's got the zero carbon footprint because you don't need to drive anywhere to get there. So this is the gem of all gems. And we bought the property when the whole market was devastated and nobody wanted anything to do with it. And the biggest issue we went through was you, you got to deal with the, the market pricing. So the market pricing in Tehachapi is not, is not California pricing. It's not an average of 550 because uh, Laguna Beach, Newport Beach, uh, you know, throws off San Francisco, throws the house, the average off. The California average is 550. The, when you leave the coastal area, the average in California goes to the country, the United States average of around 280 to three. So to build a new home for 280 to three, you can only build a thousand square feet. You can build a thousand square foot cottage homes, 1200 square feet, some townhomes, some apartments. Uh, we've got 12% of the inventory bigger than that. Uh, that was the issue that the city was really choking on was, okay, we're going to have a, a whole, um, a whole community full of cottage homes. They weren't used to that. Once they once they understood that we're going to build them a a four hundred million dollar tax base, provide a million and a half dollars a month to the downtown core, and create hundreds of construction jobs and full time jobs, then they realized, okay, this makes a lot of sense. So you know, we go down the pathway, and you know, I got to give the city credit too. I mean, this is you know, this is again, it's a weird geopolitical subdivision. Our property is representing an immediate valley of 37,000 people, but within 40 minutes, it's representing a million people that want to live in Tatchby, but there was no housing stock. They want to live there because it's the safest city in Kern County. 2,000 people that live there are law enforcement officers. Everybody else works at Edwards in the aviation industry, but there was never any housing stock. So we cracked that nut, but we're, we happen to be in the geopolitical subdivision called the city of Tatchby. It's only got 8,500 people. So it's got one planning director, one general manager, and you know we're kind of we're overwhelming them a little bit, right? Yeah. But, <laughs> Who are but, these guys know, coming to town? <laughs> you know, when, if you want, but you to made do, a deal and a half a mil, six hundred eighty-eight homes for a million to bucks. That's less than two thousand dollars a home. It's it sat there for a year. <laughs> That's uh, genius. It, it, nobody nobody touched it. I was I was I was bizarre. I was freaking out. I was going, <laughs> hey, you know what? I I grew up in East Van. Um, I was born there in 1960. I was born one block from Vancouver Tech, Slow Cannon 8. And, you know, if I drive by there now, these little, um, the little 33, three, 25 foot homes on, or 23 foot homes on 33 foot lots, they're going over a million bucks. And here I can buy 688 lots in the center of 37,000 people, 40 minutes for a million people. And here's, guess what? 90, min- 90 minutes from 25 million people. Wow. And, uh, and, and, and Tashby's a funky town. Incredible. I mean, it, it's full, it's got artists, it's got engineers, it's got some really high powered people because if you want to have snow on the ground from, you know, late November to early March, where there's like four or five snowfalls that last for a week at a time, you go to, it's 90 miles from LA. You would never know you're 90 miles from Los Angeles. You, you go there, go there in March, go there in early April in a snowfall, drive 90 minutes away and you're in Santa Monica surfing on the beach. Wow. So it's a it's a very fascinating piece of uh, uh, geography. The only time that I've ever heard Tashby before, there was an old Humphrey Bogart movie called uh, The Maltese Falcon, mm-hmm. and I think Humphrey says to the uh, gal that, that you know that, that actually committed the murder. He goes, "You're going to you're going to do 30 years in Tashby," and I went, "What what the fuck's going on over there?" <laughs> so there used to be there, there used to be a big woman's prison there years ago, and they converted it converted it to a to an all guys prison. But it's 20 miles out of town and. You know, it's maximum security, and, uh, and there's 2,000 prison guards that live in the town, so wow. it's a pretty safe, it's a pretty, very safe town to be in. Right? Yeah, it sounds like it. I have a couple more yeah. questions, Jeff. I know you're busy. I got a couple more questions for you. 
Um, are there any other projects that Greenbrier is presently working on? Any anything you can like any secrets that you can like kind of let well, our community yeah, know? Well, yeah, yeah, not, nothing that I can talk about. You know, nothing that I can talk about. We 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 own eleven million shares of Captiva Brie. You know, there's other things going on, but I there's, I, I can't make non-public disclosure. No, no, that's fine. I just wanted to ask, and then. Um, where do you see the share price in one year's time? Do you have a goal, or I know you mentioned the eleven sixty six price? You know, my my goal is definitely between sixteen and twenty. Wow, easy, minimum, wow. minimum, wow. minimum. I'm thinking more like forty, but minimum Whoa. sixteen to twenty. Forty, minimum to twenty. Wow. Well, the, the issue is with with Western Wind. I had over eighty million shares, plus I had two hundred four million dollars of project debt that the buyer took out. We only have 22 million shares outstanding. We have no debt. I mean, the, the three million in debt is my wife and I and, and a couple of directors that loan the company money. I've not taken a salary since the company was incorporated in 2009. I take no money. I take no charges for the office. I don't need to, I'm not, and I'm not going to do it. So for me, I'm running this like a, it's a work of art, right? Like it's a work of art. It, it's, it's creating a masterpiece. If you don't, don't dilute your company. Play, I play the long game. You know, people have commented to me a lot that, you know, different people have said things about me, you know, a very, uh, you know, a couple, you know, there's two or three, four, maybe four common traits, right? Loyalty, dedication. I can see a goalpost two. I can see a goalpost two cities away, right? I play a very long game. Um, you know, they say talent is when you can hit, hit a target that no one else can, uh, that no one else can hit. And obviously uh, vision is hitting a target no one else can see, right? So I look at things. I play the long game. Um, the other thing that that all the big guys write about is I'm very efficient. So I'm very skillful in just following the dollar of what it needs to get done to do what it needs to get done. Right? I'm not. When I when I sold Western Wind in 2013, I could have worked for Brookfield, you know, building solar projects all over the world. The problem is the solar market dropped to two and a half, three cents a kilowatt hour, and I didn't want to just. I don't want to work in a business where you're just trading dollars back and forth. Right? So I wanted to specialize in places that I could make a high impact. In Puerto Rico, I'm not replacing hydro generation. I'm not replacing nuclear. I'm not replacing a cheap source of energy. I'm replacing, I'm replacing steam plants that were wow. built in the 1940s that burn bunker oil, heavy crude bunker oil, which is so freaking expensive and so dirty. And I'm replacing it. And I'm replacing the mafia that's been running the, 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 the energy mafia that's been running Puerto Rico that they finally broke, you know, the monopoly for 70 years. I mean, when I was sitting in Congress, the Puerto Rican utility, there was a, there was a paper that the chief of staff presented to 46 Congress members when I was sitting there. And it said that there's a arm's length buying group that from the year 2003 to the year 2017, they overpaid $18 billion in oil purchases, 18 billion. Wow. There, there's no mafia in the world that makes 18 billion do, doing that. So the the issue is we're doing great things. The reason our shareholders are being compensated is we're taking care of big problems. I like solving big big problems, and I think um, I think that that's what makes it exciting. That's what gets me up every morning, and uh, I, I like pushing big boulders uphill because when they you know when they go downhill, when you cash out. It's a very anticlimactic moment. There's no, you think it's, you know, it's a, it's not a giddy moment. You, you kind of feel like, you kind of feel, you just, it's a surreal feeling because the boulder's rolling downhill. You can't stop the, you, you can't stop at that point. You've done what you've done. And then you got to, and unfortunately guys like me that are, you know, crazy sickos, we look for another big boulder to push up a hill. Yeah. Well, right? it's in your blood, right? Well, you've done an incredible job. We are so, so excited about your journey and, and what you're doing. And uh, Peter introduced me to it and I started talking to our community and I know that everybody's buying it. So, um, and power too, uh, Captain Verde on the Canadian and the US side. So we've got a lot of our members of our community that are very excited about your success. Thank you for your hard work and your dedication to your shareholders. Thank you. I, no, thanks, Rich. All right, buddy. Thank you so much. And keep up all the good work. And guys, Thank this you. is Jeff, the CEO of Greenbrier Capital Corp. Take a look at the company. If you guys want to get in contact with Jeff, is there a way that they can get in contact with you, Jeff? Or is there the best way for them to reach you or just a website or go to your website? Email? Yeah, yeah just oh no, just just email me directly. It's Western Wind, Western, like the word Western, 
wind, W-I-N-D, all one word, Western wind at Shaw.ca. You know, I can't give investment advice, but, you know, we suffered for eight years. We, like you say, the elastic ban is now starting last week as opposed to 2013. So play the long game with me. When I say long game, play, play a one-year horizon with me. If you want to see a lot of fun and a lot of action, the game has just begun. This is just the beginning of the game. That's All right, great. buddy. Thank Thanks you so very much, much Jeff. I'm going to go. Pleasure. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.